right, there we go. Hey everyone, Richard Carlton here. Welcome to another great day of FileMaker training at fmtraining.tv. I'm the creator of fmtraining.tv where you can learn all about the FileMaker platform and learn how to build better FileMaker applications for you, your customers, your organization. This broadcast is completely free to everyone and is being broadcast in high definition to Discord, YouTube, and to Twitch. This broadcast is being recorded, which is really great. Of course, we might clean up the recording a little bit. So if we make a malfunction during the live stream, then of course we reserve the right to clean that up on the recording later on. However, because it's a live broadcast, we encourage you to ask questions. In fact, some people get aggravated when there's this dialogue with you and we ask questions. I, I, we want questions. If you have a question, odds are other people have the question too. And so I want to thank everyone for logging in, Ken and TK and Dave, Dave One, Dave Learning, uh, Ed, uh, Elzo, uh, Carol, Jake, Mike, all of you, welcome once again to another great broadcast. Now, as a reminder, if you want to check out the upcoming broadcast, go to fmtraining.tv, press the left tab for the live button. You can see the upcoming broadcast schedule. That's pretty awesome. Additionally, if you want to help support this channel, right? We always say this, uh, this broadcast is brought to you by fmtraining.tv, bringing you the greatest and the most entertaining FileMaker training videos available. So the idea is that if you want to help support the channel, make sure you check out our on-demand video bundles. We have videos that cover the latest version of FileMaker. We have videos that cover the deploy course. In fact, we used to sell the courses individually anymore. It's just much simpler to sell a complete bundle for a low price. We do this on an annual basis. So if you buy one of the bundles, that really helps support the channel. It ensures that we can keep coming back every day because this podcast actually takes a lot of money to run. The people here don't work for free. So today is another exciting broadcast today. Today is going to be day two of our upcoming broadcast with the uh, FileMaker server for Linux Ubuntu with 1804. 1804 is the, uh, the steady place where you install it and it should be supported for a long time. And uh, so 1804 is the product for that. That's great. Uh, look forward to uh, the continued conversation there. Yesterday, we kind of went through the process of setting it up. I don't know, Margaret, if you can hear us, can you switch to Jacob's uh, screen? Jacob, if you want to show your screen, want to pick up the conversation? Sure. So I see your screen, Jacob. Looks good. We're showing your performance tuning thingy, whatever. So this is our completed. Why don't you walk us through what we did yesterday so everyone can catch up with where we're at in the conversation? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So what the the basics of what we did yesterday is um, from scratch, we launched a uh, an Ubuntu 18.04 machine and then also updated it just to be good about that. Um, and then we installed uh, the fresh copy of FileMaker Server 19.3. Um, we didn't do the license certificate yesterday. Um, and however, we did do the SSL um, so that I can actually so that I can demo like, the license certificate the easy way today. <laughs> um, we could do it. I think we can do that over the command line, actually. That would be possible. We basically did SSL install, and then I uh, cranked the, uh, the in-memory record cache, which is the main thing that we always tell everybody to do. If you do nothing else, get your backup set up and make sure your record cache is appropriately set. So Oregon Dean, what was Oregon Dean's really good questions? What was his question? It says, so I was able to complete the install yesterday on Safari. I was able to bypass the SSL requirement in order to load yeah. onto the server and import the certificate. So I'm live. Server config and FMS config tidbits welcome. So what little nuggets of... Yeah. So... Let's see here. So I actually do want this one. All right, I should do escape, Q, clear. There we have a nice screen. Um, so one of the things, and I wanted to cover this again. So um, mostly because we, other than like at the end, real quick yesterday, we we have not covered this on stream before. Um, the one of the so Oregon Dean was able to work around his issue, and it was the same one I ran into. It's why I did it, why I did the SSL install on the command line yesterday, um, because I have been to the Ubuntu at RCC address previously, and on recent um, versions of FileMaker Server, the server will communicate to your browser once you're over a uh, you know verified good to go secure connection, i.e. not that 
the temporary SSL that they ship with. Um, but if you you know you have a real SSL in your server, um, recent versions of FileMaker Server will tell your browser only ever connect to me over a secure connection, and that will screw you if you try and come back in later and you're trying to you know uh, you're up you're up a creek but you have a paddle you need to get it into the water um, and you're trying to connect with your browser to either you know feed a new license certificate file put a new SSL in because you've removed it and you're trying to you know do something with that because I don't know something's broke or been corrupted or or it's just a normal one where the SSL expired you forgot about it and then you have to come in after the fact um, I wasn't able to override that and that actually is quite difficult on browsers but if you have not connected to the server previously um, for example in Safari Chrome Firefox etc you will be able to override your browser um, and tell it no 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 I you know I'm the human I know what I'm doing thank you um, let me you know let me connect to my thing um, so the thing that we did yesterday was to demo <laughs> I actually love this it's because our password is password um, so the thing that we demoed yesterday was putting our SSL in. Um, we only tuned one thing in the server, uh, which was the uh, the, the in-memory cache. Um, as always with RCC, we recommend people turn up a few things. One of the things, let's see. Uh, yes, I can type history in the console. I don't know what helpfulness that would be. That'll just show you all my commands. I think someone asked for all of my commands yesterday. I can like put them somewhere if that's useful. Yeah, there. That's right. I don't know if you guys, uh, if I can draw on here. Can they see it if I draw on this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All yeah, right. So that, that right there is, the, is our memory reconfig command because this is a 16 gig machine. Is that what this is? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. Okay, so we set it for a little bit under half. Half. And yeah. and of course, so so two. I'm just going to repeat myself because it bears repeating. But we have run into people who leave this. They buy a ten thousand dollar server. And then they're amazed when the Amazon server kicks the ass of their ten thousand dollar server, and it's they got a cheap Amazon server. And it's because when they bought the ten thousand dollar server, they threw hardware at it. They never changed it, so the cache was set to like five hundred twelve megabytes or something, and they've got a ten or twenty gigabyte file. And when we set up our server, we set the cache correctly, so suddenly a very smaller server can outrun a beefy server because the beefy server is misconfigured. You must, must 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 set that and if you don't then you're just going to unnecessarily suffer now if you have a customer you really really hate right you don't like them or you don't like your boss or something then set it for like you know 50 megabytes or something and give it the old college try but i um we we run into this all the time where people are like yeah we're file maker experts okay what's your cash us oh, default and then they suffer and then and then, then they go our server's slow why we're we gonna hire richard to make the server fast like okay. i i think i literally had someone either yesterday or wednesday email me and they were they were asking about performance you know hey is there any kind of kind of base level recommendations you can give on performance um you know with their server and you know he sent the specs over and did all that kind of stuff and so i like looked at it and i was like mm, no the hard you know the hardware that they sent you know, number of users you know it was spec fine basically um operating system was good hardware etc and i and so i was just like can you run this command and it's the uh here i'll run it actually just for giggles um uh, uh, server config cache size uh, i have to type my whatever oh i have to type it correctly sorry everyone there you go. So I had him type uh, that and a couple of others to, you know, sort of see how they'd set up the system. They'd configured the RAM cache and stuff like that. Um, and they, they had bought a, a very reasonable server. They were serving 20 to 25 people on average, um, and they had never increased their RAM cache at all. And they were wondering why their solution was getting slow um, when everybody was on it when they had their, you know, if they were in the peak of the day, 20 to 25 people banging on it simultaneously. So did they change um, it? And did they did uh -huh, it go faster? Yeah. I don't know. I haven't heard, I haven't heard back from them yet. They were they probably won't, um, right. They'll be like, Oh my God, it's all great. No, I know that. Yeah. The client was, was passing these things on to his it guy, um, which is another one of these situations where the it guy is super smart. They know exactly how, you know, all the systems work. They can manage all this stuff, but they're not familiar with FileMaker, And so they had, done a reasonable job of installing uh they confirmed that they had you know at least hourly backups you know I, i'm sure you know if i audited it i'd find other issues or something but just on a basic like person who doesn't isn't familiar with filemaker but is trying to do due diligence it, was, it wasn't bad um but they'd never increased the ram cache because it's not on the admin console you can't set it there and so if you aren't familiar with filemaker you'd never know that that command exists 
you know, that was the that was the uh, that was the main one. I always want to turn tell tell people to turn that stuff on, and it's like, I the it, I you know there were there we we talked about it before. It's like there were people in the community that didn't want to upgrade from 16 because they wanted the log viewer back, and so we've got the log viewer back. I didn't want to upgrade from 16 because there's no RAM cache setting on the admin console anymore. Um, and while that box was kind of over in the corner on the old one, I, you know, I don't really care where they put it as long as they put it in front of people. Because if you, like functionally, obviously we don't recommend it. There's other things on the command line that we'd recommend you change. For example, here, let's do another one. And set uh, server config. And then the, the other one that we turn up is the log size. How big How big are the log files that it what should be? Oh yeah, yeah, log size, yeah. All right. So that's one of the other ones. Like if that was the only thing, and, and actually that one was on the 16 admin console as well. But uh, but if that was the only thing that they, you know, of our of our things that we change, so you've got to go in, you've got to turn off auto open databases, and but 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 and then the log files are not on the admin console, but all the other settings were on the admin console. I wouldn't complain too loudly. It wouldn't matter. And yeah, right. uh, Christian Smith's correct. You can set a ton of settings via the admin API. You can do all kinds of stuff, actually. Um, we Oh, that's a... We should do that on a future stream. I would have to build stuff for that. But... Build what? Um, well, something, you... something that can toggle stuff on the admin API or something well, like that. Well, that's what, that's what the uh, solution does from Klaus Levent, right? The brain mm -hmm. basket, right? Yep. The, the server admin tool. Yeah. Does that talk to this? I mean, I guess we could try to make it work. Uh, it's, that would, I don't know if it's. I don't know if they've updated it with support, but probably. Okay. Were we going to bring in Christian today? I, I thought that, that's right. We were going to bring Christian. I was today. thinking. Yeah, I was going to try and install his plugin on the. Um, oh, why don't we call what Margaret? Why don't, you, why don't you dial and see if you can dial him up? All right, Christian Schmidt, talk us, talk us through the, your All three putting folders. the folders. Talk us through three different folders, right? Yeah, he unzipped it. All right, so let me back up. So for those of you who are not familiar with this, we want to take the Monkey Bread plugin and install it on the FileMaker server. And to install it so it can be used everywhere, you have to install it in three different locations. So three different copies, basically the same file, but you're going to duplicate it or whatever. In three spots, it goes in three places, right? Do I have that correct? Yes. Uh, do I need to? I don't need to do anything, do I? No. Okay, cool. This is where Christian Schmidt talks. So I'm going to mute myself, and you two should be having a dialogue. Well, you just uh, got the folder, so just make an LS and see what's inside. Uh, oh, sorry. Yes. Yeah. So and there and you see the there's an MBS file with build number. And in the Discord chat, you have the folders. So ah, there they are. Yeah. So opt filemaker. Maker server database. So we'll, whoops, I have to do database and extensions. And so we'll copy that there and then we'll do it again. So we're going to come back and we're going to do web publishing. And we'll do publishing engine, CWPC plugins, that. And then web publishing engine, WIP, which is the DAPI one. It may yeah. be that our FileMaker may not see the plugin and not refresh the listing of the folder without restarting server or restarting the, the service. Linux. Yeah, the Linux uh, box. Let's find out. Um, so if we go to connectors, we're gonna, hold on, let me I'm gonna do one thing, sign out. Let's see, force the issue. Um, connectors, plugins. Ah, we got one. But now you oh, can to... uh, use the toggle. Turn yeah. that on. Wait a second, and then click the. Uh, FileMaker does only show the MBS on the first entry. So for the for the. So so let me ask. Yeah, for... Let me confirm that. So when you put plugins, if say if I saw if I also installed 360 email or something. Would I see both of them here then, like a list of them here? Yes, you see a list of them. Server plugins. And so down here, it doesn't show them. Nope. Yes. Okay, that's like an uh, inc incomplete, need... incomplete thing or something. Uh, right. You need to make the toggle there for the MBS one. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. 
And now you can take a look on the logs folder because our plugin creates a log file there for ah. cloud scripting, web publishing, and data API. And if the log files are down there, I see, I see the server scripting. Those are yours, yeah. right? Yep. Yeah. So you may need to turn off the web direct or, or restart the server, whatever you like. So we think it's activated uh, the one plugin, but the other two are not running is what we're thinking. Yeah, the version number is printed to the error one. Still okay. an error. Uh, oops. Nice. Yep. That's loaded at least. Yeah, so we won't get the data API or the web presentation engine until those are restarted. Um, they don't do anything live. But so yeah, we have well, it. You, yeah. We have it in server currently. So if we, I don't know, stop the server probably. Uh, can I do this? Yeah. I think that gets me what I want. Shuts all the stuff off. That's Again, you can just look in the folder and see if, if you get new files. Mm hmm. Java is cool. So I see server scripting dot log and then dot old. Yep. So have fresh ones um, so we can you said the uh, the error one is the one that I want Oops. that one and then uh, it? Nope. <laughs> oh. there's nothing in the output so uh, is web engine running Yes, it is. Um, let's see. So we have web publishing is all turned on. Yes, 100%. Data API is enabled. Um, and then what? Maybe you just started. OK. We also do have two questions from Akunops on Twitch. Can we see the plugin state via terminal command or tail the logs? That's a good What's question. Um, I'm thinking of. Hold on. So, is there a plugin related status of clients or databases? No. Um, add remover list, set stuff, run center zone, list. Ah, list plugins. Maybe. Would that cover all of them? So yeah, I would expect that only covers the, the server script engine. The server, yeah, probably. Can you do an uh, FMS admin restart uh, for the web direct process? Yeah, just a second. That only gives us, yeah, yeah, so that's probably only the database engine. So yeah, I don't, I think the answer to that question is no. So all right, so we'll do FMS admin, uh, restart WPE. By the way, for, the, for those of you wondering about, that's a super useful command right there, the web publishing engine, mm -hmm. restart. Yep. There's, yeah, there's two two amazing ones. Um, one is if you have your web publishing stuff running uh, wild, well, uh, maybe three, actually all of them are good, actually. So you can do web publishing. Um, another great, so I'm gonna do this one. I think it's just Dappy, let's find out. Yeah, no, it's not Dappy. <laughs> uh, help restart, let's move right data API. Oh, I'm sorry, it's FM Dappy. My bad. I'm dappy. There we go. Um, so there's that. So you can see it on screen, actually. So there's a few amazing ones. One is, um, yes, the web presentation engine. We're restarting the data API because theoretically that's going to load in the plugin. And so we'll be able to either see that or use it. Um, and then the third one that is really, really, really useful is um, this one right here, the FMSE. Um, it is uh, not totally uncommon for even senior engineers to, for example, make a loop that does not terminate um, in a perform <laughs> script on server. Um, yeah. And so, uh, because sometimes you don't quite expect the data to be how it is and uh, something goes funky or, or you just have insufficient tests for when you need to bail out of your 
bail out of your looping process. Um, and so this is how you save either yourself if you're the senior engineer or uh, your senior engineer if you're not the senior engineer. Um, you can come so, in and restart uh, that. Can you make the LS again? Yep. Well, there's a lot more in there now. That's yep, a lot There you go. Way. Yeah, I see STDR web and uh, out DAPI. Yep. So, cool. so hang on, hang on. So these two, what the, is it these two right here are the server, the main one, the server? Or yeah, that server? So you, yeah, so you have so you have server scripting. Uh -huh. um, you have web, which is WPE, uh -huh. and then you have data API. Yeah, okay, good. And you can good see job. some of these are dot .old because uh, we restarted, for example, the ah. database. We rebooted it, so we've had it load twice now. So we have an old and then a current log. Yeah, so, we, we added the old because, uh, well, if the plugin crashes, you want to read the last one mm -hmm, before mm -hmm. the crash. Uh, so the tracing messages go to the our file, and other messages may go to the output file. Mm -hmm. Sweet. I'll say that again. Say that again, uh, Christian. What goes where? So we, we redirect uh, the standard error uh, for our tracing messages, usually, and for errors. Um, and the standard out is for the normal print to console type stuff. Yeah, OK. Sweet. Yeah, so that'll make it really easy to debug. Um, because if it, if Like it, if you use our MBS trace function, it will lock all plugin calls into the, the error lock there. So you can see live with a tail command all the MBS calls. Yeah, it's like a verbose. It's like so you said trace. You said trace, right? But it's, trace, it's, yeah. It's yeah. like a. It's like a ver Jacob. It's like a what I would consider a verbose command. It's like just like mm -hmm. it's very yeah. It's, bloggy. it's it spews all the details. Yeah, right. Which is what yeah. So yeah, it writes out all the function calls with all the parameters and results. So you actually see what's passed to the plugin, and you may notice that maybe your container you're working on doesn't have the thing you think it should have. Oh, you know, have, turning that on in general is not a bad idea. How do you turn that on again? Uh, trace the you call it trace. It's function? just a plugin call. I mean, oh, it's just a plugin trace. call. Okay, yeah. you just it, put it, it, it in your script on the start, and okay. maybe uh, so yeah, it's maybe off. It's you off can make like a, a test script, yeah, and we can trigger it on the data API. Uh, yeah. Uh, act, let's see. I don't have, I actually don't or have MBS. You just in my... edit uh, the default example, make a button somewhere uh, on, on a layout, and uh, call it in WebDirect by clicking on it. Let's see. Um, yeah, sorry. I'm just laughing because I my uh, my FileMaker actually does not have MBS installed. Let's uh oh. See. I know. Uh, it's because I just upgraded to 19.3, and one of my clients has, I think, 10.5 mm. is what their their whole system uses it. So, um, and then 10.5 doesn't load in 19.3. So, <laughs> bad demo. Well, we have a plugin which works from FileMaker 7 to the latest one. Mm -hmm. So, so what? Th this one right here, the plugin 11.2 works from FileMaker 7 all the way forward. Yeah, on Windows you can draw it in. Windows uh, in FileMaker 7, if you still wow. have that. That's wow. so awesome. Yeah. Well, so everyone understands that to take advantage of, of, hold here for a second, to take advantage of a plugin really in all the areas. So this is so your FileMaker file through, through um, running a script, like a PSOS or SASE script, you have to put the, the plugin in here whatever this location is at. And so that's one copy of it. Then if you want to have the web publishing engine access, it would be like WebDirect or something. Is that what this would be? Mm -hmm. web, okay. Uh, yeah, either WebDirect or yeah, WPE, like PHP talking to the XML API. PHP. P, so the PHP gateway or WebDirect. And then this is for DAPI, which is the replacement for basically mm -hmm. the PHP gateway, right? So yep. once again, that's kind of a separate. So and three copies in three locations. And the DAPI plugin specifically is the one that's the new location as of 19.3. So. Okay. Uh, plugin for Mac. Copy, reveal, paste, replace. Awesome. We have a very interesting question from YouTube. I think 
I don't quite know where they got confused, but they asked, is FileMaker open source now? Uh, no, uh, yeah, negative. <laughs> Short version, no. <laughs> Short version is no, yes. They, yeah, they're um, not like not answering the actual question, but one that's nearby. Um, I I will take a moment to pay compliments. They are, for example, in the cha in the the change logs and the updates, and you know, here's what we did for 19.3. Um, they actually did include because they're using open source libraries under the hood for some of the stuff that they're doing that's really common everybody does that these days um and uh, i was very happy actually that they're putting some of the version numbers and stuff in there um that's really useful for the rest of us if we're you know if we have to write something that works better or worse you know use whatever that library is like for example we now know which library they're using for json processing inside of filemaker um like we know the exact library and version number now um and so if we have issues actually um we can determine if it's like an issue with claris's implementation an issue with the library etc so yeah Got the it. thing the, the when the question comes about about open source it's important to understand that filemaker is effectively the original low code uh, development platform that goes back for 30 plus years there's no other product in market that has the kind of legacy and uh, ecosystem and all the established, uh, you know, user base, right? Um, and so it has its own, frankly, its own like scripting language. It's very low code ish, very plain English, um, uh, much simpler than a typical programming language. Um, and it, and so it gives you that ability to do quite a bit with minimal amount of skills, learning basic steps. Like if you say, I want to print, I want to print the screen I'm at. Okay, the command is called print, <laughs> right? And so or you want to go somewhere, then you say, go to this screen, literally, and you name the screen, and it's very simple. So um, it's not open source because it's a competitive uh, ability to uh, deliver this. Um, and, and if they had made it open source, then um, you know they probably couldn't charge what they charge for it, right? The stuff's not free, um, but the upside to it, it does a tremendous amount, and it really kicks ass in the uh, low-code market and it has you know hooks to pro code right it does standard web it, you, can, you can support standard javascript within the product it can interact with apis out there as a consumer or as a source of information it can talk through odbc to uh, sql or oracle data sources things like that so it does quite a bit and it does support a lot of you know inter interoperability with other systems both proprietary and open source um so uh, it's important to understand what it, why it is what it is, and um, the fact that it has its own kind of like little lightweight scripting kind of language. Um, you know, it, it it's what makes it low code. It's why people get to where they are with it without really being programmers. A vast majority of people get into FileMaker are not programmers, and if you uh, they just get into it to solve a problem, and they kind of then they stop learning. They've got enough of it. They solve the problem at a professional level, like at a Jacob level or at a Christian Schmidt level or other people who are like legit professional code people, um, they can bring their code skills in and in implement JavaScript and CSS under the hood and do some really advanced integrations and things like that. So the JavaScript is open source for the most part, right? And, you know, CSS is just formatting, et cetera, et cetera. But you can bring those open source elements into this platform and it, to expand it. And it's so, it's so low code all the way to pro code. It's, it's, quite, it's quite good. Okay, so we actually have acquired a list of questions now. Uh, I'll start with the ones on Twitch first from Labo404. Has anyone tested in Docker? Uh, yeah, you'd have to talk to, if you want to talk about Docker, you need to talk to uh, Febreze. Febreze. Yeah, he's in Europe. So do a search for F A B R I S E or whatever his name is and FileMaker. And we've, uh, he, 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 he's a Docker expert, right? Oh, there this he guy. is. This, this guy. Is, so. this, is, this is the hosting company that where they do that. So if you want to run FileMaker Server and Docker and use that for your hosting, or you just want to play around with it and see how the performance is, um, you can get a trial on here. Uh, he, whatever, figured it all out, and that's his hosting service now. So Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. So. Um, but basically, generally, uh, <laughs> I suppose the short version is he put in a lot of work, and so I'm not going to, like, challenge that or whatever. Um, but the performance is impressive, uh, basically. Um, and the reason for that is because um, while FileMaker Server itself doesn't necessarily span all the cores for all the operations that it does, uh, Docker will. 
And so the bubble around FileMaker Server allows the work to be spread out appropriately. Yeah. Um, the bubble that is Docker around the FileMaker Server process. And so um, it lets you have, you know, you have, oh, I have one FMS, it's for one client, but, you know, you put it on one of those, the, the wonderful new AMD uh, Epic processors or something like that, and you've got 32 cores or so, whatever. Um, and so if your solution needs to take advantage of that momentarily, um, if you put it inside of something like Docker, you'll be able to do so. So uh, There's also a, a guy in Germany, Niels, who made a, a few scripts for that, for mm -hmm. using Docker. Oh, nice. I posted the link in the Discord chat. In Discord? Awesome. Thank you. Okay, I will All right. also move my... Okay, so the next question is, Raccoon Op wants to know if you can turn the plug on, like, at terminal. Like, do you have to swap and do, like, the little clicky? Or could you enter a terminal command? I think that's what he's saying. N no. <laughs> I think. Yeah, I think, here's... I think, no, I think no is the answer to that question. Here, here, I don't know of a way to enable it. Here's the so. funny thing. You made in the uh, admin API documentation. Oh, yeah, maybe. Basically, uh, it used to be that you had a web console and then you had a command line. And the command line kind of would more or less mimic what was in the web interface. And so then what this guy did is he broke it, broke up all the commands and all the things you had to do in server and it, it just like threw them up, cut them in little like, if you cut up like a jigsaw puzzle and you throw that crap up in the air and let it land on the ground and then you have three groups, right? So you have a command line interface what you've seen today, this web interface you see right here and the data admin API. To fully administer the FileMaker server, you pretty much need to be able to do almost all three. You, Jacob pretty much gets away with the command line for the most part and the web interface, so he doesn't do a lot of DAPI. But to be honest with you, I think there might, and I don't know if there's a couple things that are only DAPI specific, but I know there's things that command line you can't oh, yeah. get other places and what, whatnot. One, one, right? of the, one of the commands that I, I actually want, it's um, not only is it admin API only, it's cloud only. Um, they've, been, they've been working on, and it's in cloud currently, so I can talk about it. Uh, they, they had a, uh, an admin API thing to patch up an existing database, um, basically to like automatically apply the data migration tool. Um, mm, yeah, you could put you could post your new one. I think there's like the normal one. It's like an, a you know scripted file upload or something. You could do that kind of thing too. Um, but the really neat one was was API based patching of the database, um, and, and it basically it did it it did something maybe like a dumber version of what uh, three sixty deploy does, um, and yeah. that's amazing actually yeah. um but we don't have it on server it's cloud only probably maybe because they're experimenting with it over there i'm sure there's some they've, they've there's some interesting issues that came out of it that i remember them you know publishing yeah. book fixes for but um but at some point i would love to have something like that actually um, yeah yeah the logic behind how they what they decide to put into cloud and what they don't put in is um something i don't fully understand and no one's articulated to me kind of how they get to that decision making uh, Oregon Dean had one, but I think Jacob answered it, but I'll read it out loud anyway. Uh, is there a way to migrate a dozen plus ODBC configs from an existing 1.x Linux server to a new Linux server? Uh, yeah, and I think my answer to that is mostly I think you're just going to bring the commands or bring the config files over. Um, I don't think that much of that has changed from CentOS to this one, except that uh, I actually don't know where the documentation for that is. Um, so it was one of the it's one of the main differences between the old the the old CentOS the the, the pre what nineteen point two and earlier nineteen point two and nineteen point one FileMaker server. Um, it that the the CentOS installer drug all of the ODBC drivers in. So you literally, as long as you're on any of the standard list that's like everybody already knows it's supported, um, like that was already installed on the system. And so yeah, like it's. I find it annoying because you have to go customize a configuration file to, you know, put your address, the database name, the user and password and stuff like that in. Um, but like, all the drivers are there, so you just have to be like, oh, I want a MySQL database to, 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 and type all your stuff out and be done. Um, and so it's it's not bad from that perspective. However, on Ubuntu, I think it only drug in a, like one or two of them by default, and so if you need like Oracle or something, you have to go fetch it. Um, that's not hard. It's Linux, but um, I don't have their documentation of the command in front of me to like demo it. So I guess I could go find that. 
Uh, oh, Oregon Dean, he asks what file to bring over. There is an odbc.ini in the server um, that contains all of your configuration details for those odbc data sources. Um, that actually, where is that? That's probably a really good question. Um, and then, actually, I have a, I have a, I do have a clarifying question for you, Oregon Dean. I assume that you're talking about FileMaker Server, um, and I, and and the reason I assume that is because you're asking. But there, you, and it's one, it's an annoyance. Um, the old cloud, so FileMaker Cloud for AWS or Cloud One as we usually call it, um, actually had a graphical interface for configuring all of the, okay, cool, he says FMS, yes, perfect. So, uh, but Cloud One had a graphical interface on the admin console for configuring up all the ODBC connections. And so you could come in here and like, I can click on here and that's cool. And so now it's, you know, the features enabled and then I can go in and type in my little text file um, and type my, you know, my database location, name, username, password, stuff like that. Um, but on cloud one, there's a graphical thing, right? There would have about where my mouse is. There's a graphical thing present on the admin console that would, you know, you could drop it down and say, all right, I want a MySQL, uh, you know, type the IP in here, type the, you know, do all that stuff. Um, and so it would handle it for you. Oh, you are 1.x cloud. No, it's not there anymore. No, you're looking at where that should be currently. Um, yeah, FileMaker Server doesn't have that interface, unfortunately. Um, and it was, it's probably, it's one of my little things that I would grouse about to Claris if they want to uh, listen. Um, I think that would be, I, I think, I think you know, bringing that together, I think that was, one, I think that was one of the wonderful features of Cloud One. I think it should be brought back. Um, I think anything that they can do to put uh, some of this stuff that's, you know, I know not everybody uses ODBC or whatever, but um, but one of the uh, one of the wonderful parts of FileMaker is that everything's accessible and everything's uh, not everything, but most things are pretty user friendly um, and basic at a certain level. And so it's one of those things where I, I dream of the concept where you could send someone into this admin console and say, hey, you know, go here, click on this button, go to the connectors tab, hit ODBC on the left, and then you could tell somebody how to wire, you know, someone that's not super technical, you could tell them how to wire it in for you. Um, and then you as the developer can come back later and, you know, start pulling that data inside of FileMaker and doing your, your cool stuff. Um, but just having someone who can, you know, they're IT people, they're smart, but they don't, maybe they don't know FileMaker. If you could write them out quick directions for how to set up something like that, I think it would be fantastic. Um, I, I wish that that would converge back. Um, let's see. I'm gonna Google it. So <laughs> I think that Jacob is dealing with one that just came from Oregon about where does the ODBC dot any ini file go? Okay. Yep. Um. And so uh, there is different ODBC drivers. There's how you deal with that. You have to. All right. So there's different. They provide some of the locations for this stuff. Um, and then finally, this is where your DSN goes. So you're going to be creating a magic text file in uh, etic, etc, odbc.ini. Um, and that's where you're going to put your stuff. And here is a template. Let me copy this link and put it. Um, there you go. That's what you're looking for. Um, and so that will, that'll give you the details. So what, what I'm talking about the interface is basically this stuff that you're looking at right now, the, what's the driver? Okay, we pick MySQL. Uh, what is the database name? Where is the database hosted at? You know, what's its IP or, or domain name or whatever. Um, and that, like this kind of stuff that's right here in, in front of us, uh, it's on the admin console in FileMaker Cloud. And I think that's wonderful actually. Um, but these drivers are not automatically drug in by default, um, at least for the Ubuntu version of this right now. Like I said, I'm, I'm hoping that some of this stuff gets gets either improved or expanded upon in the future. I don't know if that's gonna happen, but I'm gonna say it and hope that someone does, hears me and listens. So, because that would be fantastic for the product. <laughs> I, had, I had a client that, um, they have like seven ODBC sources, I think, on their FileMaker cloud. And one of the reasons that I, I suspect they haven't, um, we've been, it's, it's been, we'll say the migration has been a little bit slow. Uh, and I think it's because it's gonna be, you know, me writing this seven times um, in their text file when we move them over. So 
I don't know. They may they may end up on a Windows server or something like that. But um, but if we put them on an Ubuntu FMS, you know, I'm going to be sitting here typing text files, so which is fine. But I just it could be framed later. <laughs> All right. Do we have any Do we have any other questions from uh, Twitch or or the Peanut Gallery? Uh, okay. There's one from Labo404. Not really in the subject. Is there not? Oh, it's not, so it's not really. There we go. Ken got it. There's not. Uh, is there another way to rename files without the developer tool? Rename file. files. You mean like a multiple files in one solution? Uh, like um, like you have five FMP12 files that talk to each other. Is that what we're talking about? Um, oh, Twitch. Oh, Twitch is like ninety seconds. Yeah. So. Um, yep. All right. Well, it, okay. If you have five, if you have multiple files that make a solution, right, a single solution, they depend upon each other. You're going to want to rename them, ideally in an ideal world, with the developer utilities that are in FileMaker. Um, we covered this um, pretty well where we talked about developer utilities in a live stream, Margaret, about ten days ago. Yeah. So, so there's a in a lot the last week or two was a live stream about developer utilities is right here. So this is a screen right here. So how, go ahead and cancel that and then show how to get to it again one more time, if you would, Jacob. So you go into FileMaker and you have to, I don't, can we see the menu? Is it hiding? Oh, it's on your other screen, right? Is that what's going on? But you're gonna go up under the tools menu, right? Yep. So, so if you're in FileMaker 19, you should see the tools menu. If you don't see the tools menu, you need to go into preferences and go to a checkbox that says, in fact, J Jacob, bring that, that up. You gotta, box. Yep. And then you're gonna check the that one right there. And then you have to quit and reopen file, like quit FileMaker and completely restart, okay? Yep. And uh, then you'll get the tools menu. Once you pop the tools menu, you'll go to developer utilities. And then from there, you can go through the rename process, right? So we cover, but we covered that pretty well, I think in the, uh, mm -hmm in the uh, the live stream of Margaret one of you guys can find that someone can find that about 10 days ago it's called develop we were covering developer utilities looking for a way to automate it after using the migration tool mm. are you using the migration tool in a way that it's going to rename the file afterwards because you could just not rename the new version or rename the output copy the data migration tool you tar you, you identify the source the clone of where its data is going to go there may or may not be rename options in there, but that's uh, one file at a time. Name. You know what you yeah. want to think about doing is talk up, talk to the people at 360 Works about deploy. Unless you're like fundamentally broke and cheap and you have no money, um, in which case you probably shouldn't be doing what you're doing. But if you're, um, the deploy tool would probably support that. Would be my guess. Um, if not, they would know it's supported or not supported. But the data migration tool is normally a tool that you run, and, it, and it, it does one file at a time. So if you have to upgrade a five-file solution, you have to run the data migration tool five times, that's going to suck. You need to use, like, the deploy tool, which gives you a, a, a web, a web, a graphical front end to it and allows you to do all five together and then take them down from the server, do the dump, and uh, move them over for five files or however many files is, and then post it back up on the server. So... Um, yeah, so I that's only seven days, Jacob. I don't know if it's going to show all that, but yeah. Or well, you can scroll. Long. You know, if you're doing a lot of data migrating and moving files, and you're taking a, a set of files that makes a solution and, and post you know down and posting them up. You need like a 360 works on that. I would. It's what I would do. Um, if you try because renaming them in flight is just kind of one of the small items that you have to do when you're updating a solution. Right, Claris has been playing with this a little bit with the cloud tool, but the cloud tool is built almost deliberately so the developers won't want to use it. Right, so um, yeah, it's kind of an interesting dynamic when they do this migration thing in only in the cloud tool. Yet there's so many other limitations that cloud tool that Claris knows they know if they're re reasonably honest or they're paying attention, they know the developers will not use it and don't endorse it. Right, it's kind of like wow. So. Um, it's not me. It's not me pitching a fit. Just go interview any any of the uh, any of the senior partners or senior developers that are in the community about cloud cloud two and and ask them, you know, and they'll go. Huh? So yeah, yeah, they'll go. We don't use that. Yeah, that's what they say. We don't know. We don't know. <laughs> we've, well, they yes, we've heard there's a new feature or we've heard there's a new version out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, they're using FileMaker Server because FileMaker Server doesn't have the limitations. Anything, uh, Christian Schmidt, on your end, you want to chime in before we call it a day? No, but thanks for installing my plugin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no worries. <laughs> well, it's and we did it legally. Thank you very much. We have a legal license. All right. Oh, well, you can always try it without a license. Oh, try it without a license. All right. Good. Try it without a license and it works for a while, then it quits working. All right, Margaret, that's it. Roll credits. Okay. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs>